Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And we are serving up all that jam. A lighthearted look at the weekend jam bands. Where we break down the jam scene's biggest stories, talk new bands, upcoming tours, and show reviews. A little laughing, some hot takes, and an always positive message for the community. Week of April 10th, 2023. And we're back. This week, Fish will be hitting the road again in Seattle for spring tour. So we'll touch on that for a second. We have our interview with Upstate. They talk a little bit about set list construction studios. Also a great uh, little bit that we're going to get into about the state of the industry. And we also have Amanda's top three stories of the week coming up. How are we doing, Amanda? Hey, Kevin. Doing great. Hopefully your week is off to a good start. Yes. Got to see a uh, bikini kill with my youngest last Thursday. Was this the show that had been rescheduled a whole bunch of times? Yes, this was the third time it had been, fourth time. So it had been three separate dates before that all got postponed. And uh, simply fantastic. Such a, such a dichotomy to, I saw Aquios the next night, just that, you know, they had an, a bikini kill on an opening band, Mannequin Pussy, came on, played 45 minutes, cleared the stage, set the other band up, bikini kill came out, played an hour and 20 minutes, boom, it was over. It was fantastic. <laughs> Aquios, I loved Aquios so much, but they had an opening band plus two sets, so it was a four-hour affair that you were down there, which I find a little interesting. Um, Aquios, I'm sad to see them go. I'm sad that I didn't see them nor after seeing them. They did Let's Dance to open the second set, which was great, and they were playing this theme, and I was like, what is this theme? What is this theme? And this guy next to me is like, oh, it's Friends. So they were playing the theme from friends in the middle of one jam and which was great when you can't place it but uh did you get out any last week or um let's see so um saturday um i helped out a buddy uh, my friend dave halchek um he's a uh, music manager he's a musician he plays in a, a couple bands out here in denver and one of his bands called giant walking robots played a show at a local venue <clears throat> They're really great. Um, like Jamtronica got a little reggae influence. So I helped out, sold some t-shirts. Um, so that was really fun. I love to do that, as you know. Yes. I was hanging out downstairs at the 8x10 of uh, Aquios with the uh, the woman down there. And oh, I yes. was talking to her. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, should I shut up? Am I talking to your off? She's like, no, we can't hear the band really. Anyway, I was like, yeah, it's way yeah. muffled down here. That's that's a tough location. I definitely know exactly what that is. And the place I was at on Saturday, I was in the lobby, but literally it shares a wall and it's all open so I could hear everything. And I'd pop in every couple minutes to maybe take a picture or video or something. But um, I know it's tough when you can't hear anything. Yes, it is. Or if it's just the, the, the thud. Boo, 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 yeah. boo, you know. <laughs> Exactly. So there we are. All right. So let's, uh, I, I really want to get into the upstate thing. So let's jump into these top three stories of the week. The top three stories of the week. All right, cool. Um, yeah. So found some interesting stories. Going to save what I think a lot of people would think uh, maybe is the most exciting for last. Um, this first one. Um, I had read that last week um, a British band um, had sold some Banksy artwork for over $2 million. And it's kind of an interesting story. Um, so this artwork had been given to the band. The name of the band is Brace Yourself. Um, this was given to them, I think, in 2010. And here's basically what happened. The group had agreed to change its name from its original name, which was, I think, Exit Through the Gift Shop because Banksy wanted to use that as a title of um, his 2010 documentary. And so in exchange for changing the entire name of their group, Banksy created a painting. Um, it has a Grim Reaper on it, driving like a bumper car. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, and originally it was valued at um, around $600,000, um, but it was kept in really great condition by the band. Um, so they just put it up for auction, sold for over $2 million. Um, some of that's going to go to Music Cares. Uh, so I wanted to just mention that because Banksy is a total mystery, but I guess he has some kind of connection to this random British band. And uh, 
does this band still tour or have they broken up and they're just cashing in? Um, you know what? They do tour. Um, and I know they've played in California before. I don't know how much more around the country, you know, that they've, they've gone, but, um, yeah, they, they definitely still get around. Um, I have not heard too much of their stuff, but definitely very curious now. All right. Our second story, um, and Kevin, you may have heard of this. I don't know if you did or not, but Mick Mars has sued Motley Crue for firing him. And not only that, has accused the band of faking live performances. So just when you think, you know, the glamour of the the 80s and that era has passed us by, get a little drama. Um, Had you heard about this? I I did read that and I broke out the popcorn. This is going to be fantastic. It is going to be so interesting. So I guess Mick is accusing Motley Crue of conspiring to kick him out um, after, you know, some different um, medical issues. I think he can't he, even stand up, apparently. Yeah, he really was unable to continue touring. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I guess, as I read, he threw his former bandmates under the tour bus. I like that one. I don't have to use that one from now on. Um, alleging that everybody basically is using pre-recorded tracks at concerts. Woo. Um, yeah, he's got inflammatory arthritis that I think he was diagnosed with a long time ago. But yeah, it's it's pretty pretty bad. So seventy one. I know. That's I know. that that boggles my mind because I think of most of my heroes from that era are mm-hmm. my age, and I guess the rest of the band's a little bit younger than him. I guess, um, but he was a founding member, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and I think in the beginning, yeah. though, in in that uh, whatever the movie is, mm-hmm. uh, the Motley Crue movie, they say that he was like ten years older than the rest of the band. He had been kicking around L.A. for years before okay. he joined them. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, and I guess you know a big part of this, of course, is financial, um, because even though he couldn't go on the road anymore, Mars was really clear when he retired from touring that he would remain a member of the band, like in every other way. Um, residencies, studio recordings, and in his mind, or what he thought is that he would become or remain a 25% shareholder in Motley Crue, you know, dot co. But according to the lawsuit, the band held some kind of meeting without him, can't make this up, where the decision was made to kick him out and then offer him a 5% share in the band's tour revenue until the end of the year as a courtesy. I mean, that sucks. <laughs> Uh, and they were trying to kick him out of, I guess there's, uh, uh, Nikki Six has, there's several corporations, seven or eight of them. And Mick Mars was like, I didn't even know some of these things existed. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and there's some gaslighting accusations. I mean, I, I feel like this could be our whole episode, so I don't want to get too far into it, but you know, apparently, um, there was, you know, some issues with Nikki Six allegedly, telling Mars he had a cognitive dysfunction, that the guitar playing was subpar. I mean, I don't know. It's Maybe this is the kind of story we need right now to just help us get, get a couple couple minutes of, uh, you know, like Real Housewives drama, except it's Motley Crue. So we'll have to see what happens with that one. And then the third story this week is a little more straightforward. Um, this has been everywhere, so I felt like we needed to talk about it. Pretty Lights um, announcing return and... I don't know, Kevin, I, I can't get away from this on my feed and I don't mind it at all. There's been an incredible video that was put out last week. Um, five years it's been um, since Pretty Lights, uh, Derek Smith announced um, that return and hasn't really seen a stage since um, the two shows that he did um, at Red Rocks Amphitheater were the last ones. Um, and no new music t- from 2017 until last week. So people are very, very excited. It's going to be interesting. Now, this is new music and a tour? Yeah, absolutely. So the video kind of introduced new visions for the tour, um, including PL Live in Dub, which was accompanied in the video by some really like heavy sonic waves. Um, and then the fantastic Pretty Lights, which is a collaborative effort um, and actually features a bunch of, no surprise, Denver-based musicians, <laughs> Boren Lee from Break Science, amazing, Al- Alvin Ford Jr., Chris Carnes, a bunch of others. So um, I think whatever's going to happen is looking to be pretty exciting. Very nice. We're going to have to keep our eyes out. Hopefully they'll uh, 
<clears throat> drop some more videos and give us some more clues to what's going on. Do they have dates for anything or this is just, hey, we're back, look for us? Um, so I know that the locations have been mentioned and there, you know, there's a bunch everywhere uh, from here in Denver, Brooklyn, Chicago, uh, the Caverns is in there. Um, but I don't know if I've actually seen dates yet. The poster that I saw did not have any actual dates. It was just more of a, almost like a movie uh, promo poster kind of thing. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, I mean, that's like a textbook way to drum up some interest. And I, I think people genuinely are excited um, that that's coming back. Yes. It's going to be fantastic. Um, so I didn't, we didn't mention this at the top. Those were the top three stories of the week. We got fish coming up the little spring tour. Let me ask you, my big question to everyone is, we know that, you know, they released January. Uh, Mike put out that song tilting that he has new music coming out. And also we've heard that Trey and Tom were writing together in Annapolis. Are we getting new songs? I don't see why not. You know, they're, they've yeah. always been so comfortable throwing stuff out there. I'm sure there'd be at least a few. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's going to at least be one every night. Something's going to pop up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they're not afraid, and they have no reason to be. But it seems like with all of that happening, I'd be surprised if they didn't. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. So, all right, new music, Upstate, <clears throat> which are who are on Royal Potato, released an album last weekend, and um, when the 31st, I guess it was two weekends ago. And it was called You Only Got a Few. We spoke to them and we got into a little bit. This first thing we're going to listen to is about set list and the studio versus playing live. So let's take a little bit of that and we'll talk to you on the other side. I haven't ever looked up your set list. Are you uh, changing every night or are you a band that more has a core set? We we change it a lot. We'd like to be a band that has a couple of core sets that we kind of uh -huh. you know the A B C D. But we're uh but we're we're a little whimsical, and I think we uh we want to sharpen the experience on the road. So we're still a little bit testing ideas. Hey, you know we've never started with this one. What if we what if we kick it off with this one? See how it. I think we've been hesitant to to commit, <laughs> and you get you know the thing is like you have your initial impressions from a set. And then you two months go by and your memory fades about, was that really, do we like the way that was arranged or was it just a good night? Um, but I think the big thing, just to answer your first question is we're, we're loose, you know, we're, we try and engage a lot with each other on stage. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I don't think this is a lot different than many other bands would say, but it's just, it's looser in a certain sense in the live setting. Um, but we try and have real fulcrums that keep it reined in, that keep it clear. So the song, what it is and what it, what we're putting out doesn't kind of unspool. But then within those kind of the spine of, of the live show, we try and have a lot of, depend on a lot of live engagement with each other as much as we can. Yeah, and I will say that that with this, uh, with the songs that are from this new record, um, which, which uh, you know, we we love the music on this new recording so much that uh it kind of makes up the bulk of our set lists <laughs> at, at this at this stage right which is i think a pretty good uh pretty good indicator for for having it you know be a record that we're all really proud of is that we just want to play these songs and and i think that this is generally true of of any band as well but um uh you know as we're as we're starting to play those songs live more we are using the recordings we made as as foundation, as jumping off points. And so, um, you know, uh, if you talk to us in six months uh, about, you know, if you ask us the same question in six months, we'll probably say, oh, it's it's morphed in these ways, in these ways, in these ways, right? You know, because that's kind of the nature of, of bands that play well together and, uh, and kind of want to keep things fresh is that you kind of, you know, add a solo. The, the song is a living organism. Exactly. That's right. That's right. And so, but, but the one that we created in the studio is one that we still really stand behind and are really proud of. And so, um, it's like your senior portrait. 
Yeah, right, right. Letting, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just sort of like let that be the thing that we're trying to copy for now, you know, because the, the energy in the studio is a lot like the energy on a stage, but you're just capturing one performance, right? You're just capturing one moment of it. Right. And so, uh, you know, so we just kind of keep going back to that performance for now as, as sort of like, you know, what happened here that sounded really good? What happened here? How did these interactions happen? And it's almost like we're relearning from ourselves. Do you go do you record and go back and listen every night to the shows? Or do you guys play the show and it's behind you and you've moved to one you have it in your past? We've gone through phases of both. We we tried that for a little while when we're working when we were having um because we've we've really rotated the lineup a lot. I mean we've had we've hired and even now, you know, we hire uh, different drummers and and different uh, accompanying musicians. So, in you know when you're getting some the the gigs always sort of like iron out things that we've been working out at rehearsals and kind of like re, um, sort of what also just what works for the sound of a room. Because even if we get the band really tight rehearsing, you get you know when you start playing for crowds, you see like oh like just for the mix you know the monitor mix. Who do I need to hear more? Who do I need to hear less? That's something good to hear. Uh, back in recording um and yeah i think to dylan's point too is uh i think we made this record with less less sort of like regard to an audience in some sense than we have previously just in that uh i think there's always a creative tension between are you being responsive to something you're hungry to hear or to play or are you being responsive to something you, you feel from the pull of the crowd one way or the other? And I and I think both of those are really valuable for like like a living band, like living music. You want to be responsive to an audience insofar as they're responding to what's what's alive and what you're doing that you might not be privy to. You might not have a clear picture of. Um, but there's a time when that can get, I think, out of whack and you start playing to the, there's a difference, I think, between playing like from the energy of the crowd and just like playing to it totally. And okay. so there's, there's a tension I'm always trying to. Uh, That's interesting. There's a to, distinction there, huh? Yeah, I, th- I, I really think there is, because I think you can kind of like, uh, you can get, you can err to one extreme and become really self-indulgent. Like, I don't really care what they like. This is about me and what I want to do and what I, you know, and you really turn in, which is a really alienating artistic thing. And I think it's kind of prideful, but there's another extreme, I think, where you can just like play with it almost like with a lack of confidence, like, oh, do they like that? More of that. Do they like this? Less of that. You know what I mean? Kind of like, and either way, it's not sort of like drawing both you and the, the audience who's responsive to it to somewhere else someplace but there's another way of approaching like you make something with confidence because you hear it strongly you you your heart resonates with the, with the song with you play deliberately and you just recognize in a sense what lands and what doesn't and you can take a moment to see oh okay did that not land just because it didn't just you know and i'm gonna stick to it or did that did that really land and re- resonate with the audience because we're really we're hitting something tender there and it, and it just let it guide you a little and i think if you're aware that there's a little push and pull and sensitive that there's some wisdom of the crowd and some wisdom of the artist and have attention you can get a really fertile place so that's what i'm looking for with this record i think yeah it's interesting i feel like i feel like audiences you know both the performer and the audience have a have a, a moment where they have an opportunity to kind of teach each other uh, you know, like the audience teaches the band about how to play to them. And then the band teaches the audience about how to listen, you know, and, and you do that by, by, uh, creating tension, uh, as, as a band by, by doing things sort of in, in a way that maybe you hadn't done before, or, uh, you know, creating silences and, and, uh, creating sort of long held moments and breaths and stuff. And, and then just really kind of letting it rip, <laughs> you know, and and uh, and kind of creating those those things helps to helps to create this sort of narrative sense in a in a show in a live performance that that is sort of in the in the moment kind of you know the audience and the and the performers are kind of showing each other what, you know uh, what to do and kind of you know what what's working what's not working and so and so I think uh, you know being being really like aware of those of those moments is really good.
But when are you guys hitting the road again? When do you have your next dates? Yeah, so so the the record is uh, released on uh, on the thirty first of March, and uh, I think our first date is on the thirtieth of of March, and we start a run of shows um, to to release the record. So, Kevin, I love when we get to talk to people about um, studio versus live, and I used to think that it was kind of a genre specific answer, which is not necessarily true, um, but always fascinating to hear what people say about that. Um, Before we continue on, wanted to just make sure that I reminded everybody out there uh, to follow us on social media at All That Jam Pod, and that's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, And then also uh, make sure that you are listening, subscribing, and giving us some reviews. Um, You can find us on all the major streaming platforms, so we really appreciate that. Um, And we have a little bit more with Upstate, so let's get back into that. Um, One of the things that we also like to chat with Um, our artists about is what they think about the state of the music industry right now. So let's go check that out. So you have records, you have CDs, you have that kind of thing. I know that that's, you know, not like it used to be. You you don't move, you know, 50,000 units anymore or anything like that. Where do you see the industry going? How about this? Is, Is the streaming model sustainable for artists? No. Well, I loved I loved that in the second you asked that question, there were just crickets right away. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer, huh? <laughs> I, right, exactly. I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think we've we've proven to ourselves time and time again that it's a little bit difficult to predict where the industry is going at any given time. Um, you know, the 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 short and easy answer is that without without CD sales. Uh, and, and, you know, um, actual sort of hard units being sold, uh, uh, the, you know, that live music is, it continues to be a, a large portion of a band's, you know, main sort of resources and income. Um, uh, but Harry, what do you, what do you have to say about that? I think technological changes often just kind of come into something and and the production side and the social side of what that means for how artists or musicians relate to labels relate to promoters relate to uh these new this whole these all these new entities which are the third party streaming distributors um just has to play catch up so you you can't kind of it, it's such a young technology and it's so dramatically altered the revenue model um I think you can't take anything for granted that how it is, how it's playing out now is how it's going to stay. And I, you know, I, I think this is, this is getting worked out I, from what I hear in like, you know, with in the film industry and television with Netflix and that version of it too. Um, but there's, there's so much bigger structures and more collective bargaining that'll kind of soberly implement that here it, it, with music. It's the wild West. There's not like similar entities. There's a lot of artists are independent. Mm-hmm. The, the mediating role of the labels has really been diminished for smaller artists than it. It, than it seems it, like the only people with any power anymore, besides the streaming platforms, are the booking agents. There seems to be an independent network of them across the country still. Yeah, I think I think that's true because I think live music revenues gone up dramatically. I mean, it's 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 a it's a growing part of the music industry. Um, and I think part of partly this revenue model of, you know, the pro rata streams of, you know, you mm-hmm. get a fixed amount for however many listens you get, regardless of who they come from. Uh, it favors the broadest audience you can get over the kind of the deepest audience. Like how many of those listeners are buying tickets are really listening a lot are, are, are you a favorite band for them or buying your merch, that kind of thing. And I think for streaming to, reflect that in its revenue model would would benefit a lot of uh artists with a real reach with a real fan base that kind of cuts deep but aren't sort of casting the widest net right and i actually i wonder one thing i really wonder about is whether the incentives there would change the way records get made i mean would change the kind of sound like what we were talking about with the response to the audience there's the you want to be responsive to the point that you're drawing from them, but not just playing to it. And I wonder how that would change. We always have to balance 
how much we're responsive to the people we can rely on, like the fans who who love you and who've really made it possible for you to do it, which are a small sliver of who's listening to you, versus how much you're responsive to just every ear you might catch. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's reason to be, you know, I mean, this is this is this is my theme for the interview, but I, you want to balance that. It's so funny that when I asked them what the state of the industry was, there was that dead silence there for a few seconds, um, which probably says everything about it, you know, where they are. Um, I guess with Upstate, I find it interesting because they're more, you know, like they said, they have a couple set lists. It isn't like Fish that every night is a different set list. You know, they're like, we have our good songs. We have our songs we want to do, which is, I guess, more akin to a bikini kill kind of thing than an aqueous kind of thing, but fascinating stuff there. Fascinating yeah, stuff. You know, and it seems to work for them. I mean, they've been around for over 10 years. I know in that was a little bit of time on, you know, maybe um, kind of figuring out their lineup and, and just some other things around COVID and whatnot. But, you know, that works for bands to your point. I think that maybe for you and I, that's just not what we are normally used to, but I think that's probably more common, you know, than not overall. Exactly, exactly. This week, the rest of the week, we have uh, Jeff Fierson from Further coming up talking about box set. They have a show coming up this weekend out in California. They've been together 30 some years, which is crazy. Um, Wednesday, we have Matt Ruffino on the intersection of punk and Grateful Dead. We asked him about his origins and he got into a little bit about punk and the Grateful Dead and how they're kind of the same. And I think both of us agreed with that. Um, Thursday, Sponge is going to be talking about their fans. Friday, we have a really interesting little clip with Mike Dillon when he met Mike, um, when he met William Burroughs and how it led him to stop doing drugs, which is a good thing. Um, and then our Saturday preview is going to be Natalie Brooks. And, and then our Saturday preview is going to be Natalie Brooks. And next Monday, the Alan Evans interview will be coming out. So, so much good stuff. And again, thank you everybody for, for jumping in and listening. Our numbers have really been shooting up there and I'm glad that people are getting to hear what we're doing. You got anything else for us this week, Amanda? I'm just excited. I've got um, a local show that I'm going to be heading to Saturday uh, and then some, some other stuff coming up. Do you have any music this week, Kevin, that you're going to go see? I don't believe this week. I am going to go see Yam Yam, but I don't think they're till the 20th. So okay. I Give got two weeks cool. out on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, right. I guess we'll, uh, we'll have some fish web streams soon enough. Yes. Yes. I'll be doing the recap shows. Me and Tim are just going to run through spring tour and be doing them 15 minutes after on Wook Plus. So check that out. And we will be back next week, like we said, with Alan Evans. Make sure you check in every day. Every day but Sunday, we got something going on. So make sure you check that out. And remember, stay beautiful, but don't stay underground too long. I'll see you, Amanda. Okay, thanks, everyone.